Legend has it that a spiritual ancestor blessed Ramji and his wife Bhima that they will bear a son. A son who will brighten the dark horizon of his people. The son Bhimrao was thus born on 14th April 1891 in the military colony of Mao in Madhya Pradesh, his father being a Subedar major in the Indian Army. Bhim Rao spent his childhood at Dapoli. His family shifted to Satara where he lost his mother. He was thus brought up under the loving care of his paternal aunt Mirabai. In school, the teachers were kind and compassionate. One of the Brahmin teachers was fond of young Bhim and was so impressed by his intellect that he lent his own name to the young student. And thus, Bhim Rao Ambadavekar became Bhim Rao Ambedkar. Despite the congested accommodation Ambedkar's family had in Bombay, first in Dabak Chol and then in the Bombay Improvement Trust Chol, surrounded by the labor area and the underworld, young Bhim pursued his studies diligently, often sleeping in the company of goats, reading in public parks and under street lamps. Ambedkar was married immediately after his success in the matriculation examination in the Baikala public vegetable market. The age of the groom, 17 years, and the bride Ramai, 9 years. Education continued. After graduation, he served the progressive-minded Maharaja of Baroda, Sayaji Rao Gaikwad, who provided Ambedkar with a scholarship to go abroad. Before he set sail, Ambedkar lost his father. Columbia University, New York. Political science, moral philosophy, anthropology, sociology and economics were his subjects of interest in Colombia, where he could quench his thirst for knowledge in the libraries rich with books. Ambedkar had a passion for knowledge and an obsession with books. Above all, he knew he must study hard to fight his battles back at home. He drove himself to keep a punishing schedule, foregoing all the comforts, spending all of his time in libraries, burning the midnight oil. In 1915, Ambedkar was awarded a master's degree for his thesis, Ancient Indian Commerce. From USA to the London School of Economics for advanced studies and also putting in terms at Gray's Inn for law. But his scholarship remuneration had run out. Despite his efforts, Ambedkar had to go back and serve Baroda State on the insistence of the state's Diwan. A brief stint as a lecturer in Bombay's Sydenham College and then this unusual young man of learning who had launched a crusade against the system of caste attracted the attention of Shahu Maharaj of Kolhapur, himself a reformist prince who worked hard to break the hold of Brahmin priests on society and emancipate the downtrodden. It was at this juncture in 1920 that Dr. Ambedkar, under the patronage of Shahu Maharaj, launched a fortnightly to articulate the anguish of his depressed community. The journal was appropriately titled Mukhanayak, The Dumb Hero. After all, 
Dr. Ambedkar was the greatest follower of Mahatma Jyoti Bapule, that outstanding man who championed the cause of women and the depressed in the 19th century. Soon, the prince offered him a scholarship to complete his discontinued studies in London. And Dr. Ambedkar set sail for England in July 1920. While resuming terms at the London School of Economics and Gray's Inn, Ambedkar turned his full attention to general reading, giving a free rein to his avarice for knowledge and books. The British Museum Library, the famous repository of knowledge for centuries, to which many a great man of learning had made a pilgrimage seeking enlightenment, was Dr. Ambedkar's favorite haunt. Ambedkar virtually starved himself to buy books. In any case, his funds did not amount to much, eight pounds a month. He lived frugally, hardly spending anything on clothes or transport. He often trudged on foot to different libraries to save money. He completed two theses for the London University, Imperial Finance in the Provinces of British India and The Problem of the Rupee. In London, Dr. Ambedkar simultaneously put in terms at the famous Gray's Inn. A man of versatile intellect, Dr. Ambedkar, even as he completed his thesis at the university, was called at the bar the highest honor any person of his background had achieved till then. And although fully immersed in this academic pursuit, Dr. Ambedkar never for a moment could forget his people back at home. Prohibition. No subject which touched the lives of the downtrodden and the weaker sections escaped Dr. Ambedkar's scrutiny. He became the acting professor of Government Law College. His fame began to spread far and wide. Young intellectuals from the depressed classes began gathering around him. Dr. Ambedkar was called upon to give evidence before the Simon Commission. His deposition evoked a furor and consternation in religious and political circles. Dr. Ambedkar was invited to the round table conference in all the three rounds of the round table conference, in the plenary sessions, in committee and in subcommittee meetings. Dr. Ambedkar used all his erudition and skill to champion two causes, India's freedom and safety and the protection of the depressed in a free and democratic India. Dr. Ambedkar supervised the designing of the house personally with a view to accommodate his vast and unique collection of books, his principal passion. Books he starved himself to buy elected to the Bombay Legislative Assembly in the first general elections of 1935 as an independent Labour Party candidate. This party, newly formed by him, won 17 seats. He gave deep thought to the plight of the working class, 
even as he organized workers' trade unions. He spoke on the finances of the state and the nation. Agrarian problems, such as the consolidation of small holdings, attracted his studied comments. Hustle and bustle of his busy public life, the scholar and the public-spirited man in him produced several monumental works. Among those particularly acknowledged for his erudition and referred worldwide in academic communities were his works. Education, in his view, was the major weapon to fight social evils. His long-cherished dream was fulfilled when he founded the People's Education Society and started Siddharth College at Bombay in June 1946 and later the Milind Mahavidyalay Aurangabad. Later, Dr. Ambedkar donated his vast collection of books to the Siddharth College Library. The huge library testifies to his wide range of reading. Challenges were awaiting Dr. Ambedkar. He had a mission to fulfill. Destiny awaited him in Delhi. In July 1942, Dr. Ambedkar was invited to join the Viceroy's Executive Council as a Labour member. Dr. Ambedkar was elected to the Constituent Assembly of India in October 1946. His outstanding moment came when he was elected and made chairman of the committee to draft the constitution. Thus it was that on August 15, 1947, India met her destiny and became a free nation in the world. Dr. Ambedkar, besides becoming the law minister in the interim government of Free India, was ordained to become the principal architect of the Constitution of India. The happiest person was Mahatma Gandhi. It was a proud moment for India, he told Ambedkar himself, that the former downtrodden had become the lawmaker of Free India. Ambedkar's extensive knowledge of world history his profound commitment to the universal democratic principles and concern for safeguarding the human and political rights of the minorities went into the monumental work of drafting the document. His reply in the House on the prolonged discussion of the draft is considered among the remarkable speeches in India's parliamentary history. When the Constituent Assembly, in the name of the people of India, adopted the constitution with its 395 articles and eight schedules on November 26, 1949. No less than Dr. Rajendra Prasad, President of the Constituent Assembly, and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Prime Minister of the Interim Government, paid glowing tributes to Dr. Ambedkar. <laughs> I prefer Buddhism because it teaches pradhnya or understanding as against superstition and supernaturalism, karuna or love, and samta or equality. Dr. Ambedkar's embracing Buddhism was an epoch-making event. It shook the Hindu society to its very foundations. Nearly a million untouchables accompanied Dr. Ambedkar on his new path. But more important than the numbers, the grand Diksha ceremony symbolized the denouncement of the Hindu caste system and the pernicious practice of untouchability. Thus ended on December 6th, 1956, the great journey of one of the tallest sons of India. Jo bichhude hai piyare se 
भटकते दर बदर फिर सोशल रेबल एंड येट अ कंपैशनेट रिफॉर्मिस्ट अ प्राउड नेशनलिस्ट हु वुड नॉट कॉम्प्रोमाइज ऑन द राइट्स ऑफ द डाउन ट्रॉडन एन आईकॉनो क्लास्ट हु बिलीव्ड इन द नेसेसिटी ऑफ रिलीजन a champion of women and the minorities kabira the last outstanding leader in the glorious chain of social reformers maharashtra has produced ranade phule agarkar and ambedkar the great son of india who gave self respect and political rights to the millions of untouchables of india haman sir bojh bhari kya Intellect 
and sense of social justice. You all have patiently listened to me in my attempt to encapsulate and highlight parts of Dr. Ambedkar's inspiring life story. What has been assigned to me uh, is constitution and governance, the Indian experience. My understanding of this is that I am required to make a connection between a country's constitution and the, the practice of governance, not the system of governance in that country, and to look at that against the backdrop on 14 of April 1891. And therefore, we are commemorating 125 years of this very important person. And that's why, of course, the lecture is done and the panel discussion is done on the 14th of April. In fact, we put it on the 19th, and we have to say that. And therefore, this has gone very well in our discussion today, and we are happy that we are doing the right thing at the time this great man was born. And therefore, to begin with, Honorable Abdul have actually defined what constitution means legally. However, politically, in our context as political scientists, and my students are in this hall, they are very excited to see this lecture, is that constitution to us, as defined by Professor Wade, is that it is a document which set out the distribution of powers between and within and among the principal function of the state organ of the government. Politics basically always look at the power. So it's always to us something that always distribute power and that document is what we call the constitution. And basically, politically, a constitution may be defined as an organization of offices in a state by which the methods of their distribution is fixed, the sovereign authority is determined, and the nature of the aim of the pursuit by the association of all its members it is prime. What does it mean? It means therefore that members who prescribe toward the constitutions are also pursued and they are included by the sovereign authority to be part of the document that we call the constitution. So that is how we define it politically and that's how we look at it in our context of constitutional politics in, in the Department of Political Science. Now, let me come back to the main task, the geese of this presentation. The geese is that what do we understand by a written constitution in our context? What does that mean? It means, therefore, in South Sudan, a written constitution is drive the people. And that's why you always, if you look at the program, the preamble of our constitution, it talk about we, the people. And we, the people, it is you and I. We, the people of South Sudan, are grateful to God for this opportunity and are thankful to God and so on and so forth. That is what a written constitution means in our context. It is people driven. It is supposed to be people that are supposed to champion it and this is what our constitution is saying. A written constitution also is codified constitution. It is a document that is written and it is available like what I'm telling here. It is not what perhaps Honorable Abdul has mentioned of the UK constitution, which is basically acts of parliament that have been combined together. Our constitution written, and we can go back and look for it. We can do reference to South Sudan constitution. But it's not, of course, what the UK has, what the Israel has, what the New New Zealand has, and what the Saudi Arabia has, including even Canada. These countries do not have written constitution. And therefore, our constitution is written, and therefore, it is easy for us to do the reference to what it. Uh, the other point which is important on the relevant of written constitution or context is that our constitution seems to be very clear to us. If you read this constitution properly, the South Sudan constitution, you always get it very clear. To me, when I read it, it's very clear. Your Excellency Ambassador of India in South Sudan, 
and uh, the university management, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and the beloved students, because of time, let the protocol remain observed. Uh, Mr. Margareta Sir, I don't know whether you can affirmatively uh, or discriminatingly favor me by adding me four minutes later. <laughs> Thank you. There are two important things here about India. One, by them I'm called I'm Justice I Joya Perpetua Fire the deputy head of uh, South Sudan Law Society. Uh, there are two important things before I begin my presentation about India. One is that the laws of the Sudan, which became the laws of South Sudan, even up East Africa, during the colonial time, came from India. It's not a question of the leader saying everybody is participating. It's a question of the people of place. Uh, this is a very important occasion. How do you relate to Southern Sudan? If now I say the High Commission of Baharat, people will say, where is this country? Baharat is India. This is what is written in the preamble. Uh, the relevance of this function to Southern Sudan, number one. Ambitkar hails from the lowest caste, the Shudra or the Pradesh but is able to be trusted to drop the post of this country. This gives us the idea that in South Sudan, people should be together without discrimination with regard to class. The Indian Constitution, and maybe, uh, every article beside the Indian Constitution is explained with relevant examples. And we today are talking about the relevance of our Constitution in regards to the Constitution of, I mean the relevance of South Sudan Constitution with regards to the Indian Constitution. Which to me, I see it's not so, so much effective and we should work into towards an informative format. To see that our constitution is an rural development. Mine is just a question. Uh, it goes direct to uh, lecturer Chol Joko. Uh, he talked about uh, the UK. The UK having no written constitution. My question is like this. Uh, uh, Mr. Chol, when do you think the people of South Sudan will respect their own constitution using the Indian constitution experience. Uh, that is the question about. That is only one question. We'll only have one person from here 